The objective today is to describe the tools and cables used by networking professionals. So I tried to take a otherwise maybe boring dull lesson on the tools networking professionals use and I tried to turn it into something a lot more entertaining and fun so forgive the bad jokes that are about to happen. The first thing we'll talk about is this physical layer behind what we talk about in class when we're talking about the internet and we talked about the OSI model before and I mentioned the physical layer in that OSI model. Well now we're going to talk about the actual physical things that can make this um, layer possible. The second thing I'll zero in on is the tools themselves. And the last I just want to connect um, all of this to like the bigger picture. So I get really philosophical on you in the end here talking about the importance of communication and the importance of networking and the good it has done for our world. And I originally thought this would be a nice short lesson, perfect for a Monday, because in my school we have short class periods on Monday, but it ended up turning out to be a lot longer than I originally thought. So here's some quick prerequisites before even watching this video. You should know what a data center is. You should know the meaning of the word networking. If not, check out my video, Networking in General, and that should teach you what you need to know for this one. Also, watch the OSI Oversimplified video. If you made it this far, I imagine you know what binary is and the concept of encoding something. But this one we can get away with uh, you not totally understanding. This one's more of a wish than a prereq. And the last one you should really know to make this so much more meaningful is the need for compression. As we move from more theoretical areas to solid actions that you can take to uh, set up these connections in a network. All right, so no surprise, cables connect computers and that's what makes our internet. That's basically it. Cables are the big one. More than Wi-Fi or radio signals. Nowadays it's turning into light beams, but maybe you can say that because this fiber optic is in a cable, it still counts. I'm still right. Cables are what brings us the internet and all the magic that happens in our daily lives. And it's funny to think that it's not that simple, and yet it is in my picture here. Um, let's pretend like this is somebody's uh, house, or maybe this looks more like a computer lab at school. So you have one local area network here at school, and then at a person's house nearby in the neighborhood, they might have uh, several computers there. Well, actually, this looks like another school lab. This is my house down here. So you, you will see a cell phone in the picture. As soon as that pop-up goes away, you'll see um, a, a laptop and then, of course, a desktop. So here we have a house that goes to a data center, uh, two schools that go to a data center. This, once it gets outside here, this is the WAN, the wide area network. And I've read that the largest WAN in existence is the internet itself. For now, let's look at the basic cable that makes all this magic happen. This is a foil shielded cable. and. You don't necessarily have to have this blue uh, shielding in the cable. If you hear of unshielded twisted pair, you're hearing about a cable that doesn't have the shield. Nothing surprising there. Um, computers in our lab have these cables and likely any ethernet cords that you come across, um, they're using these CAT cables. And there's different types, CAT5, CAT6, etc. We'll go over that in a second. But the word Ethernet is a little misleading because this is the protocol, not the, the physical thing itself. And you can count here, we got two, four, six, eight wires, copper wires with different color around them. And then you have this drain wire. This is also known as a ground wire. And why is having a ground wire important? Well, electricity is just moving electrons. And for electrons to move, you need to somehow complete a circuit. If we imagine a toaster here, if there's a loose wire in your toaster that's touching the outside of the metal and you go to touch that metal, you can get shocked. And sometimes these devices have so much electricity that it could be a deadly experience. So it's very important to have a ground wire or a grounding. Now I read that the idea that planet Earth is the best ground to have, um, that's why birds can sit on lines that are full of electricity so if you were to touch this and you're standing on earth you would shock yourself but the bird's fine because it's not being connected to something else and thus not completing any sort of circuit the electrons are still flowing and going somewhere to complete a circuit 
electrical engineering is not my um, area of expertise. And no, the, the bird did not pass gas. That's not why the other birds are away from him. This uh, came from a security article I read about internet companies staying away from certain bad hosting companies that are giving IP addresses to spammers. But let's focus here. What did I just explain a drain wire is? And then what is an unshielded twisted pair cable? Let me talk a little bit more about this before you answer. You see, with electricity flowing through these wires, there's some magnetic stuff going on, and, and this can create interference. So by shielding it, you reduce that interference. Oh, and look at my awesome connection with this Wu-Tang guy hovering above the ground like he's not on the ground. So there's my hint to the answer right here, what a drain wire is. And so let's go back to the concept of a shielded cable. Why would you need the, a shield? Why would you need to limit this electrical interference? Well, the, or at least a lot of people could get by without having this type of cable. As it says here, there's, it's only needed in specific environments that have high EMI, high electromagnetic interference. And check out what the material of the shield is made of, alumin, aluminum mylar. Quick check for understanding here, what did I say EMI stood for? And the cool thing about EMI is with this concept of twisting a pair of cables, what you're doing is you're preventing interference. Well, it says here, you don't really prevent it, rather you work with it. So this is known as differential signaling. You could dive down a rabbit hole researching this and learning about this, but basically the picture says it all, that we will have two different uh, voltages and because the cables are twisted like that, somehow something magical happens and the bits that you're trying to get from one computer to the other end up there more reliably. So they're twisted throughout the cable, but at the very end there's this little plastic piece and you see that they're just lined up straight and so you can almost visually see the place values for the binary numbers that we work with. So like over here, if it was to start here, here's the ones place, two, four, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. Yep, I just went to check 2, 4, 6, 8. So there's 8 bots in an 8-bit number. And then how do you get uh, this connection to it work? Well, you put this casing over this. And you put it in one of these crimper things. This is for RJ45. And you, and you push down real heavy on it and it'll click into place and then that the metal connectors here touch the metal there then you plug it in your computer and then you have that other metal connection going and thus you have this circuit so there's two big things you should know about the way you can twist these cables I have a fun corny way of remembering this but I hope it works for you I mean it did for me and I had to take a test on this and I passed so these tricks uh, they have proven to be successful so you could put these in alphabetical order, and if you do so, A for alphabet, you're doing it in a T568A way. But if you were to switch this up and have orange come before green here, like in this picture, you have an OG connection going on, so that you have an orange and green, or at least you have an OG um, ordering. Oh, and if you're in my computer science class, we talked about permutations, right? So the ordering of these bits matter. The ordering of the wire matters. And just think of old cable here. He's an OG and get it, uh, old cable. We're talking about cables. So 568A is the youngin, the TIA slash EIA standard. Now, that's the Telecommunications Industry Association <laughs> we're talking about. 568B was an older standard established by AT&T a long time ago. So that's why there's this difference. And if you want to be a hipster, go ahead and use the new way. Or you could do it the T568B way, where orange comes before green. No offense to hipsters out there, but we just make fun of them in class a lot, so I thought I should mention that. So in your own words, what's the difference between T568A and T568B? Man, after answering this question, you should sound really smart. Next, we'll talk about T100s. You know there's different models of Terminators, right? I don't know which is which, but... Let's go into the cabling a little bit deeper here. So there's different types of CAT cable. 
And just so you know, there are many factors that determine the ability of a cable's uh, speed to be one way or the other. Definitely pay attention in your science class to understand that part a little bit more. But I'm going to focus more on the networking stuff and the types of things that could pop up on a A plus test or a networking plus test. You should know that CAT stands for category, not CAT. So uh, there are many different categories of cable. Here they are. So this chart says it all. Here's category 5 and it uses this standard. Here's the data rate. It can go up to 100 megabits a second. Work at a frequency of 100 megahertz and can have 4 or 8 cores. And then just so on down the line. So here's the test for you. If I told you that our school computers can download up to 10 gigabytes per second, which type of uh, cable would we have in that scenario? Or I should say, which kind of cable could we have? So once you have your cable saw wired up and hooked up, there are two big problems that can occur. The first problem is a mapping problem, and the second one is a continuity problem. So how do you zero in on these problems? That is, how do you find the right wire with a, a particular problem so you can fix just that wire? Well, this tool right here would be pretty good for that. This is a tone probe generator, and it's pretty nifty. So basically, you have this device. You can take one of your cables out there in your home lab or wherever it is you're in, in your house, and you're trying to figure out this problem. So you can pull out the cable and plug it in here. And then on the other side of the house, take this little generator and uh, bring it close to the different wires you have. And as soon as the tone, the sound goes off, you know that you're looking at the, the right cable that you're trying to look at. Do you see what I'm saying here? So if I have a box of wires here, and then um, I don't know which one is the bad one or which one is the maybe um, new one I'm trying to connect to a certain port, I can connect that one end of the device here and then go down here and figure out which wire I'm looking at. You know you should watch a video on YouTube of a guy doing that to really get uh, or understand what I'm saying and I don't know why I'm using a diagram of a house because you typically might not use this unless you've created a large uh, network in your house. Uh, this is probably going to be more used in a business but you get the point right? The tone probe generator is an awesome tool. The other problem you could have is called continuity. But before I talk about that, so just to check, mapping. What is a common problem with Ethernet mapping? So that's one type of mapping problem where you're looking for the right um, cable to plug into the right port on two different ends of a, of a building. But I think usually when they say mapping, they mean something like this, where you have for your number two spot right here, you have this green cable. Over here in the number two spot, it needs to be green as well. If it's another, another wire, then that's how you end up with a mapping problem. And after explaining it to you like that, I'm thinking there's got to be a good joke here, right? So if you flip these two wires around, maybe you end up with a number like this one instead of this one going through. So I'm thinking of those like autocorrect kind of errors, you know, when you're texting someone and you write the wrong word and then it, it's really bad word or it's really making you sound bad. Is there a situation where an ASCII number can be flipped by one single bit, and that would result in a totally different word. The point is, that's a mapping problem. That would be a bad thing. So we need the wires, you know, to correspond accordingly. That way the data doesn't get all j jarbled up. Okay, the other problem is way easier. Check that out. Um, it's a continuity problem. So basically, what could create a continuity problem? I mean, my pictures are saying it all right here. Now you can get these testers that will um, test for both types of problems, a continuity problem and a mapping problem. But let's take this device for example. I wish we had these in my classroom. If anybody wants to donate, uh, let me know. But if we were to plug two cables in here, this tester will show that pin 5 is lit up when pin 5 is lit up over here. So this is a good sign. And if it was switched, it would have a red and then we would know to go in there and fix it accordingly. So there's the mapping problem solved. In terms of continuity, you could plug this in and see if you could get all your bits through without any uh, voltage problems. So let's zoom back out here and think of the big picture. All the, these cables create the internet as we know it. All these lands together. 
They're connected to WANs. The cables that are being used the most are known as the backbone. Now nowadays it's hard to distinguish what the backbone is because there's just so much. There are so many routers and so many servers connecting us to each other that it just looks like a mess instead of this like it did in 1992. When I say internet backbone in 1992, that makes a lot of sense, even though this doesn't look like a person's backbone so much. The, the idea is if I'm in Seattle and I'm getting data from um, Boulder, Colorado, you know somehow, some way, it'll be traveling through this particular wire. And then this goes global as well. There are giant groupings of wires that go from New York to London. And the story I always tell whenever I have a chance is the insanity of terrorists going to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea to try to sever these connections. That way, a European influence won't um, happen in Africa. It's uh, Behavior like that is crazy. But these wires and satellites, by the way, are connecting our whole um, planet to this global internet. But it looks a little bit more like this than what I was showing you, at least it looks like this nowadays. And if you didn't know what I meant by rat's nest, like this is a rat's nest. When these mice or rats make a, a nest, they just gather junk, feathers, pieces of wood, and other debris into a, a spot so that their little babies can hang out. That's what a rat's nest is, and this kind of looks like one. So we went from backbone to rat's nest. Now we can still call certain things backbones, like we could create, or this company, SafeLink, could create a fiber backbone and provide internet service to people in um, some pretty rural areas here. And I really like showing this picture because I used to be a firefighter right here in this area, southwest Montana and northeast Idaho, like in the panhandle area here. And don't forget my favorite basketball team, the Utah Jazz, right there. So all I'm saying is just be careful when you're using this word, internet backbone. But the idea is all about networking. Networking is good for the world. This company I just showed you, SafeLink, they have this thing called a Lifeline program. And if you're eligible, then you get free internet or reduced internet, which is kind of funny because here in school you can get free or reduced lunch. There's a version of that for adults too and with internet. Which is a good thing in my opinion. I mean, same with the United Nations opinion because they deemed the internet a basic human right. Just thought I should mention there's these other organizations that will hook you up with internet if you need it. So that's the end of the lesson here. I want you to think about your emotions and connect it to one of these attributes. And I actually came up with a good one myself today because I was motivated to do so. I'm thinking today's lesson was all about being a communicator and establishing a communication network. Being a good listener is a trait the IB program wants us to value. And after computers are networked and people can talk to each other, more importantly, people can listen to each other, you have a communication network. So when somebody posts on social media or in the comments section of a website, I think they just want to feel someone is listening. Whether someone is listening or not, this makes them feel better and so is a very good thing. And that's the beauty of being a communicator, knowing when people want to feel listened to versus actually being listened to and responded to. And I'll give everyone a hint out there, when you get married someday, I think that is the most important thing to remember. So with that said, we'll finish on a very technical DOL. Here are some tools and cables. Just connect them with their definition and we are done.